So today we're looking at neurodiversity and I'd like to welcome two panelists. So Rebecca, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi, yeah, I'm Rebecca. Everyone usually calls me Becky. Um, I'm a special needs teacher from West London and my specialist thing I like to talk about is the need to create sex education, which is inclusive, not just for autistic children, uh, which is where my specialism is, but for all children with uh, disabilities, uh, particularly if they're LGBTQ. Thank you so much. Sarah. Hello, um, my name's Sarah Kedge. Um, I'm a she, her. I am profoundly dyspraxic and also ADHD. Um, as a professional, what I do is I help organisations to utilise uh, neurodiversity in the workplace. I'm also queer, so there's always a bit of a sort of a crossover there. Um, I teach down at Oxford Brookes University on the business management programme, but I also have a coaching and consultancy practice. But I also host, um, my other big passion is neurodiverse entrepreneurs, and I host the How to Entrepreneur um, online community. When do you sleep? <laughs> this is what ADHD does to the brain. Yeah, <laughs> we've got, we're at, yeah, we've all got like a, a, a very, very visible um, passion, I think, for our community and how to support them. So thank you very much. Um, who would like to start? Um, yeah, I'll go first. Um, I'm going to warn you now, I didn't say in my title that I was ADHD as well, so I will try and slow my speech this morning. And uh, It's okay, we've and... got a transcript. Don't, don't. <laughs> um, right, okay, I'm going to try sharing my screen. It's not letting me share it. Sorry, my screen isn't allowing me to share it. You've been set up so you can share. So can you see the little green button at the bottom? Yeah. Click on that. And have you got your presentation ready on your desktop? Yeah, I have. Okay. No. no, it's not going to let me. I think it's my access. Sorry. If you want, if you want Rebecca, do you want to email me your presentation and I can share it for you? Um, yeah, okay, I can do that. Sorry about yeah. this, guys. So while we're doing this, Sarah, would you like to come in? I was going to say, do you, I don't have any slides, so do you want me, as, as gallant as I was being, should I, should I go first and then you can get all your text? That, that would be lovely, sorry this about is that. The don't apologise, this is the joy of being live, we're at <laughs> home, trying to work, and it's fine, and everybody in the room is giving us love, care and everything. Sarah, yeah. I'm spotlighting you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, so as I said, my name is Sarah Kedge, I'm a co coach consultant, but I'm also a university lecturer. And what I'm going to talk to you today is about being your authentic self, both with LGBTQ and in the neurodiverse space. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the question, how many versions are there of you? And I say this because for myself, certainly as a neurodiverse and a queer person, there are many versions, or at least there have been many versions of me. Let me tell you a story. Many years ago, my, uh, before I came out, and we're talking many, many moons ago, we were talking about getting married. And I was like, can't get married. And it's not because I was queer and I was, I was dating a, a male at the time, but it was because to get married, I had to invite people from each of the different segments of my world into one space. And it was at that point that I started to really understand and recognize that there were so many different versions of me out in the world. So how many versions of you are there? And how many of those versions are actually your authentic, true self? And it's taken me some time to start unpicking that because there was the work me, there was the straight me, there was the gay me, there was the neurodiverse me, though at that time I didn't have a label for that. There was the family me and there was the friends me. And over time, and as I'm starting to unpick myself, I realized that I changed 
and I developed and adapted different versions of me for individual situations. And some of them was because of safety. And I understand that in, I'm very fortunate living in the UK as a queer person, I am not legally, I'm, it's not legally a problem for me to be out and queer, but for safety, because I didn't feel safe. But for sometimes the different be, bits of me and the different versions of me were identified and developed because of belonging and inclusion. I wanted to feel part of a community or a space. So I adapted and I melded and I amended myself. And in the professional space, some of the adaptation was about because I wanted to progress in my world. I wanted to progress in my career. As I get older and as I'm developing myself, I'm starting to unpick the versions of myself. But how did I get them? Well, actually, throughout my life and throughout all of our lives, whenever we come into contact with people, we are, off, we are given requests to rob, modify or RTMs. And some of these requests to modify are really obvious. And as, a, as somebody with ADHD and somebody who's dyspraxic, my volume level doesn't always match the environment. So I'm too loud. I'm too distractible, too colorful. I'm too quick. So I adapted myself with obvious, express, can you please change your behavior? But within that and underneath that are always the more discreet requests to modify. The sort of like the, the faces when you turn up with a rainbow flag or you turn up with your partner and you see people go and they're being uncomfortable and you, you adapt to that. So the versions of myself have been adapted and created over years and in a way to actually help me fit in and adapt and be part of society and the environments I operated in. But it's this, that you start to unpick which one of those is actually our true authentic self. And it's not until you start recognizing that you can actually reject the request to modify. You can have someone who can say, can you tone it down a bit? You're a bit too loud. You have a choice to say, no, this is the volume I'm at. I am a dyspraxic individual and sometimes my volume is not where you want it to be, and I'm okay with that. But each of those that we do, we create them. And in the neurodiverse community, we talk about masking. And actually there's a crossover for me between the masking I do and have done as a neurodiverse person, the things that I do to behave and operate in, I've learned the language of neurotypical people. So neurotypical are people who are not, ADHD, on the um, autistic, um, dyslexic, dyspraxic, dyscalculic, have Tourette's, or an acquired, 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 um, acquired neurodiversity. So I've learned the language of neurotypical people. And the process of recognizing this has helped me to start doing the unmasking and to recognize that I am valid and I am okay as I am. And I don't need to do the heavy lifting that's required to become more neurotypical. Because that's what we do. And we do this as LGBTQ people. We play the pronouns game. I've been out 20 years. And still, when I go into a new environment, I often refer to my partner, they, them, even though my partner's a she, her. I go into an environment and mask my behavior, I roll myself in with my ADHD and that takes energy and time and it's exhausting. So being my authentic self is partly around understanding the requests to modify and starting to unpick them one by one and this is a lifelong journey and recognizing that stuff that was given to me in my school years and as a child if it doesn't serve me anymore I have the choice to put that gift down and take that request to modify and say, I'm not doing that anymore. As an educator, I'm working with in higher education. It's been a really interesting process for me to recognize that I am a really powerful tool in supporting these young people to become their authentic selves. Because when I'm delivering lectures, I am constantly 
giving them requests to modify. Whether that's my teaching style and having a chalk and talk lesson where there's stuff on the PowerPoint presentation, for my dyslexic colleagues or my dyslexic students, I'm requesting them to read stuff. When I encourage people to go into groups, I'm possibly asking my autistic students to go into a social situation that, that's really not okay for them. When, I, uh, when we're asking people to write assignments, when we're asking them to do presentations, I'm asking students to modify. So I'm starting to become more mindful. And again, this is a process. And it's a process of recognizing that I am a powerful individual in supporting these young people to develop their authentic selves and making it okay for them. And in the lecture theater, in the student environment, is making it okay for these students to say, that's not okay for me, what I need is. And then responding to that request for change. So when I go into the lecture theatre now, I'm more mindful of the examples that I give, not just making sure that not every, um, working in the business environment, not every business is white British, with white British stereotypical names, that the business leaders are always cis men presenting. But I'm making sure that I'm weaving into my delivery and my content, different neurodiversities, different ways of being and different human beings. When I'm engaging with people and, and actually lecturing for the last year online has made engagement a lot easier for neurodiverse people. Because when I do request to participate, there is more of a chance and an opportunity for people to do things in a way that makes them feel comfortable. People can say things and include themselves. They can type and they can type to the whole group or they can directly message me. So it's a way that online teaching has sort of blown us up to actually make up delivery more inclusive. And also with my own visibility. And I think this is one of the important things for me what, as, a, as an out and proud human being, my visibility in the workplace and in the education space, being able to say to my students, I'm dyspraxic, so I may be a bit clumsy, my words might not get out as right well as they should do, ADHD, I will go a million miles an hour. If you need me to slow down, tell me. What that does, not only is it makes my life easier because I can check in with my students, but it also gives my students permission to be themselves. Because I've said it's an okay space. And some of those things are really micro things, um, but they're really important for the students. And it's the same with visibility. I, I look as I do, and I'm unapologetic about that. I don't look like the rest of my university colleagues. And I'm, I'm kind of unapologetic about it because this is me. I am a professional and I look as I do and I am accepted in this space. And part of that is about me being occupying space. And I think when we think about gender stuff we, and neurodiversity, we are sidelined, we are asked to become smaller and less of. And for me, occupying space and being present and unapologetic is a really powerful thing in the education sector. The other thing, um, so, Things you can do, and I'm going to touch a little bit on things you can do, apart from the stuff I've said, um, is when I'm marking, this is one of my new things, when I'm marking, I'm particularly becoming more mindful about how I mark and about the comments that I'm making, because my students that are on the autistic spectrum need something very specific. So rather than this section is good, which is something I've read on many of my assignments and I've written on countless assignments. Stop doing that. I like what you have written here and I'll be give really specific about it because that will help that student understand what's good. I've made it a common practice and I'm encouraging my other lecturing colleagues to do an audio recording of what you've written in your comments. It's a tiny little thing. It's a tiny little thing and it takes a couple of minutes but what it does is it helps the dyslexic and dyspraxic of us understand how we can be, uh, understand what the feedback is. 
And finally, it's around the person. I mean, this is why I'm saying the lifelong journey. Our request to modify and become our authentic selves is a process of constantly unpicking the things that have been given to us throughout our lives, whether it's the, the sneers or the slightly uncomfortableness about our queerness, but unpicking them and recognizing what it is you need to put down. Um, yes, and I think that's it. Um, I do just want to mention, because I, I have a chance to plug, if that's all right, Lana, can I mention this? Absolutely, yeah. And if you give me, the, put the link in the chat. So if you want to describe what you said by mentioning it, we've got a blind person. Okay, so um, as I said at the, at the top, I run um, and host an online community called How To Entrepreneur. We're an online community of neurodiverse entrepreneurs and business owners. Um, and this year, earlier this year, we brought together a book of an anthology of stories about us as neurodiverse business owners. And we published this, it's available on Amazon. We're in the process of turning it into- So an Sarah is holding a book and on the cover, it says neurodiverse oh. entrepreneurial awesomeness. And you're gonna put the link in the chat. Thank you very much, Sarah. In chat. So yes. Thank you. So everybody's neurodiverse, they're entrepreneurial. They're welcome to join the community. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Oh. Okay, so what a really good, um, the, the comments were, were coming up and before we move on to, is that okay to call you Becky, you said? Yeah, before we move on to Becky, I think people were identifying um, about what you were talking. One person said, ah, mask, the thing about masking is so true. Um, I have tics and anxiety and I know that I'm valid, but I sometimes can't stop trying to mask my tics because I really want to just function normally. But I'm starting to realize I don't need to do that exclamation mark. I love it when that happened. Um, See, yeah, and somebody else, somebody else was saying, so true, I often think about this, about papers. I think it was you, Becky, that you put it out to, to the whole group. Yeah, it definitely. It's about um, journals and things like that. It's so complex to try and write in the research field, and it's never thought of, but actually it can be really hard to process all of those things you have to do to produce a journal. And I just thought it really limits our voices, actually, doesn't it? It means that only people who can get through that set of instructions can actually put information out there in terms yeah. of academic research. Yeah, and I think there's a real opportunity for us as educators and working in education to actually influence this. And so, so I'm doing my little bit by saying, actually, let's, let's do audio recordings. Mm. There's so much more we can do in the academic space to, to make it more inclusive. And because as neurodiverse people, we have capabilities that other neurotypical people don't have. And it's the barriers that are created by the systems, the academic institutions and expectations that limit our ability to, to actually thrive and survive and do amazing things. Thank you. I really like the approach that you have because you view it as a superpower. Um, my question to you is, um, how did you deal with internalized shame and stigma? Because the LGBTQ plus community as well as the neurodiverse community is actually facing a double whammy you know you're doubly stigmatized and and doubly shamed and you internalize that to an extent so how did you deal with that and, I'll, and I'll ask the same question to Becky as well do you know what the answer to that is for the last 20 years I hadn't and, and it's one of those things that I, I'm aware of internalized homophobia and internalized dis disability discrimination. But it wasn't until this year where I actually sat down and really started to unpick this stuff. So I'd been dealing with it by going, oh, it doesn't matter, this stuff, it doesn't matter, but I'm pushing it away, pushing it away, pushing it away. But I hadn't actually started to sit down and really unpick in myself how much internalized homophobia I'd taken on and how I how that had then manifested in in shame and I've been modifying my behaviors so even up until now I'm still sitting there and 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 thinking about this stuff and when it comes into my and I'm, I'm reading there's some amazing journal articles and some amazing papers about internalized homophobia and doing that sort of led me to a process of going light bulb moments going oh my god I do that oh my goodness ah crumbs so it's it, as I say, it's that lifelong journey of sitting there, recognizing it. Yeah, thinking. recognizing it is the first step, and then you can, yeah, that's true. And I love the request to modify 
like a few people have commented, as in like, this is who I am and these are the reasonable adjustments that I need. Do you know what I mean? I think with invisible disabilities, it's probably a lot harder to request that because you don't know how, if, if you're a wheelchair user and you request access, then people can't really say no. Do you know what I mean? Like, and well, they do, but, but, but yeah. Um, and I think there's something about because um, there's, a, there's an estimate of 50% of people that are neurodiverse don't know it. So with the people that do know it, one in seven people are neurodiverse and we know it. But half the people don't even know we're neurodiverse. So the request them, the more- Yeah, you're absolutely right. You can't look at someone and, say, and guess whether they're dyslexic, dyspraxic or, or, or autistic, you know what I mean? So yeah, there's a lot of questions. So I'm gonna ask everyone if they could please put the question in the Q and A because then they can be either typed or answered um, um, live, yeah. Just, Sorry. Can I just say one last thing around the yeah. request to modify? And this is one of the things around um, about LGBTQ and neurodiversity is that I, I'm 20 years in and I'm still learning new things that I need because the requests to modify have come through my life and become so entrenched in my behavior that I, I'm still learning things that I'm doing that I'm masking and cover up the behavior. So I think for, for people in neurodiverse, it's around making, inclusion is making it okay for anybody, whether it's neuro, neurodiverse or neurotypical, to be able to say, actually what I need is this delivery to be done in this way, or I need the response in that way. So the masking, is, again, is a long process of understanding what it is that I change, and then what it is I need to make it easier for me. And that's, that's a really, that's heavy work. Thank you. More to come. I'd like now to invite Becky. Um, I'm super fascinated because autism is not something I know much about. So when I saw your call for contribution, I was like, yes, please. More. <laughs> Thank you. Super excited because I love learning. So I'm just, um, and, and Sarah, there's a few questions directed at you in the Q&A. Can you see them? I can see one. I yeah, I've asked people, they, they were all through the chat and I've asked people, okay. and, and you can type the answers. I'll so do that now. If people do, yeah, fantastic. Do you, want me to yeah. Want, do you want me to answer the ones in the chat as well? If you want, yeah. Okay. Cool. But I think it's easier if we keep it all in the Q&A because the Q&A gets downloaded. And then when I upload the video with the Q&A, people can see cool. rather than the chat, which is like, yes, I agree with you. Fantastic, you look beautiful and all that jazz. <laughs> right, Becky, um, I got okay. your PowerPoint, so yeah. I'm super, super chuffed. I'm gonna share it. There it is. So can you all see it? Can you see it? It still doesn't let me see it. Oh, can you all see it? As long as you can all see it, that's fine. Sarah, can you see it? I can, I can, I can. Yeah, the first slide is how to support your autistic students with discussions about relationships and sexuality. Okay. Yeah. What, what can you see, Sarah? Describe what you see on your screen. Are I'm, you in the I'm, Zoom? I'm muted. No, I muted myself. How to no, support no. an autistic ADHD student with discussions about your relationships and sexuality. That's what I can see. Okay, yeah, so I can take it from here. No, so, sorry, I want to make sure that we're on the same page. Are you in the okay. Zoom meeting now? Me, yes. Becky. Yep, I'm in the Zoom meeting. Okay, and what can you see on your screen? Just you, three, you two and me. Fantastic. So now you should be able to see your presentation, yeah? Yeah, that's fine. Yep. Can you? If yep, not, can you can. can. Okay, yep. perfect. Okay. All right. So let me know and just let me know and then I'm ready to move okay. the slides. Yeah. All right. So usually, uh, as Sarah did say, I would usually present to you all and uh, just talk away about the things that I feel about this. But I decided I would go for a more uh, university neurotypical approach and create a PowerPoint to do this today. Um, so I am a personal development lead in a specialist school in West London. Um, and my role is to look at all the things that we can support our students with who all have a diagnosis of autism 
with all the bits about education that are not to do with um, academics. So um, uh, can we go on to the aims of the presentation? So today I want to talk to you about a few things. Can you go to slide two for me? This is slide two. Okay, yes, to perfect. provide. Yep. Can you see yep. it? Yep, I can. Right, so the aims of the presentation today, um, I want to be able to give you a clear understanding. There is a growing research out there that links neurodiversity, which I think Sarah highlighted to me is much bigger than just autism and ADHD, but these are obviously my focuses for today on uh, gender and sexuality diversity. I want to talk about the history of RSE for students with SCND and the history of ableism that sat around loving relationships and uh, students with disabilities. Becky, can you explain what RSE and SCND uh, are for people sorry. who are not in the UK? So RSE is uh, Relationships and Sex Education and SEND is Special Educational Needs Diagnosis. So people who have a diagnosis of SEN, Special Educational Needs. Um, and then to explore the impact of ignoring this um, and then looking at some methods that will help your RSE become more inclusive. And I've got some recommendations of some literature that will make your students feel seen, heard, recognised in loving relationships. Can I have slide three? Okay, so what is neurodiversity? So it's the concept that uh, brain difference is simply a difference um, uh, in the way people's brains work instead of seeing it as a limitation. So I suppose Sarah touched on this in terms of seeing it as a superpower. Um, and as the LGBT community, I feel like we recognize difference through gender and sexuality. And uh, with neurodiversity, it's as important to recognize that that heteronormative society that we often experience, that's the neurotypical society that our neurodivergent thinkers um, experience. It's a society where their way of thinking, or I say their, our way of thinking, um, is not necessarily the mainstream and therefore they have to adapt themselves. And that's where Sarah was saying about masking to make sure that they fit into situations that don't necessarily make complete sense to them, first of all. So um, autism and ADHD within the paradigm of neurodiversity, they become variations of the human brain, just like we have spectrums of sexuality and gender. Uh, it is a spectrum. There are different spectrums and different things. And it's so complex, this idea of neurodiversity, that actually you will never meet two neurodivergent people that are the same, just like you'd never meet two humans that are the same. And that's why autism is a, a wide ranging um, situation where you will never meet two people whose autism presents in the same way, which makes it a complex thing to understand as an educator. Can I have the next slide? So when we go back to RSE, so relationships and sex education, um, often it's been littered with a relationship ableism. So ableism is obviously the absence of thinking about um, people with disabilities in their um, production of sex and relationships education. Um, in the past, particularly through the 1980s, where there was a move in research towards eugenics and uh, really inappropriate feelings about people with disabilities, uh, people with disabilities not having loving relationships. Uh, often students with SEND were removed because they felt that they were maybe not age appropriate lessons for them. And yet, obviously, there is a, a recognition that some of our most vulnerable students in the classroom will be our students that are neurodiverse or have SEND. And it's uh, therefore even more important that they receive this sex and relationships education. Um, and so I, I think it's just an underlying rule. And I didn't notice until I was a teacher of children in an autistic environment that quite often they'll sit when we have sex education and refuse to participate, uh, refuse to want to be involved in this because they never see themselves within a loving relationship. And we talk as LGBTQ people about the absence of seeing us in the mainstream media and the absence of, um, just generally uh, uh, seeing ourselves. But actually, if you think about it in the last 10 years, the dating show that's involved neurodiverse people was called The Undateables. And the impact of those messages on the people that we have in our neurodiverse community is not acceptable. So, but the issue as educators is it can become a sticky subject. 
So there is the con conversation about age appropriateness. And when I have been doing training on this, um, I think it's important we recognize as educators that this isn't about necessarily understanding. It's about our job as educators to make sure our students understand by providing them the scaffolds to do so. But we teach people to the body that they have. And that's how we choose our age appropriateness. Um, but these societal ingrained prejudices about neurodiversity and disabilities and sex educations, they have to be unconscious biases that we question as educators, because actually everyone is entitled to a healthy and loving relationship. Mm. Uh, can we have our next slide? So why is this particularly important for me? So students with neurodiversity are living in a society dominated by neurotypical people. They have, neurotypical people have their way of approaching relationships. And I suppose at the moment, unless you make your RSE inclusive, it means it's like watching through a door. You can see the activities people are doing to create their relationships, but you're not being given the keys to get there. Um, particularly if you're also feeling gender and sexuality diverse. And obviously in the UK, that's been a statutory uh, lesson that we have to bring into all our sex education it should have started last year and obviously with COVID then there's been an extension but actually this is something that you should be taught that there are different types of families from the point you enter EYFS early years foundation so our nursery kindergarten level and it's important that the intersectionality between these two differences so intersectionality is the term that's used when we look at having two differences that can obviously have different impacts on yourself um, from the mainstream, because they're much more prevalent. So if we can have the next slide. So uh, obviously the other reason it's particularly important. So this study, there are two tables on this slide. One that shows about, um, so this is about uh, assigned gender at birth. And then we also have a slide that's about um, who people are attracted to. And the reason I've put these tables on here is they're from research by a group of people called De Winter, De Graaf and Vigia uh, from 2017. And it shows that 9% um, of male participants in their study about their, how they felt about their gender assigned at birth, 9% um, of participants with ASD felt that um, they felt different from their gender assigned at birth. 23% of male female participants of ASD felt that they felt di potentially different from their gender assigned at birth. And uh, this compared to the neurotypical population, which was 3%. Obviously, this is still something that's like um, a growing situation because uh, obviously more and more people are, as we become more um, inclusive in the society, these figures may change, but obviously there is a clear, um, difference there between participants with ASD um, and neurotypical populations. So it's therefore something we have to talk about because if we are not providing this education, it could have an impact on them. And the same again with um, sexuality. So 19% of male participants in the study felt that they were not just attracted to women compared to 10% of the neurotypical participants. And 44% of female participants with ASD felt they were not just attracted to men compared to 13% of neurotypical participants. So these are huge differences. You've got big differences where you're saying that people who do have a diagnosis of autism potentially are more likely to be sexuality or gender diverse. Can we have the next slide? So why is this important? So George and Spokes then did a... Um, study about the stress levels. So pupils with ASD often do show higher levels of stress, depression and anxiety. This may not be anything to do with having a diagnosis of ASD. It may be to do with, as with LGBTQ people, living in a society that is not built for their type of thinking. However, also, if they then have diverse and sexu sexuality um, diversity, it then increases this stress. So you can see this is particularly true in, we've got two graphs here and it shows that um, the levels of stress that they have and it shows that the highest that you are, uh, the highest group of people who felt levels of stress, depression and anxiety were ASD participants who had gender diversity. 
So therefore, there is a higher need for this group of pupils to understand and feel included in society through um, inclusive RSE teaching than even the general population. Okay, and can we have the next slide? So one approach that you can use inside the classroom is the participatory approach to uh, relationships and sex education. So this was um, a study that did this, was Turner and Crane in 2016. Uh, they looked at the stories of people with learning disabilities in loving relationships. And they particularly said that a study that could carry on from this is to look at the intersectional differences and look specifically at LGBTQ um, people who are neurodiverse. But it is important to understand that they recognised that you needed to listen to the stories of people who are neurodivergent in order to understand how to include them in their learning. So it is incredibly important for inclusive learning that you are listening to what people are saying they need from you. And that's reinforced by the framework for inclusivity, which was um, created by Black and Hawkins in uh, 2017. So we can't actually deliver any sort of inclusive education until we start to listen to the stories of the students in our classrooms. However, there are other ways. So can we have the next slide, please? So other ways that you can make sure it's inclusive. Uh, you need to know your students' needs. You need to make sure that you're doing everything you can to cut down barriers between them. So uh, the study Learning Without Limits talks about the fact that every time you do not know your student, that's another barrier to their participation in their learning. So this is not just about making sure a child who's neurodivergent is in your lessons. It's also about making sure you have the correct communication methods, that they're prepared in advance, that potentially there's been pre-learning to them, that there's over-learning, so there's extra opportunities for them to learn. And whether this is from a cross-curricular point of view, using social stories, using your visuals, making sure that you practice the maths on signs if they're needed, so that nobody feels included, excluded in your classroom when you're talking about RFC. Uh, you need to involve everyone when you're discussing it. So uh, we obviously still do have a problem, as Sarah was saying, about lots of people not knowing they're neurodivergent. This is particularly true with girls because of all the original studies to do with autism were done only on boys. So often they do say that girls are better at masking, but potentially it could be that the research just isn't there on girls with autism, so it could present completely differently on the spectrum. But everybody should have their say in what their thoughts are to do with RSE. And this includes all your students, not just those that are neurodivergent. But it's making sure that you have talked to everyone about what they want to know from their relationship education, not just blindly educated them. And therefore, this what's even more important is initial trainer, uh, I don't know about any educators here, but my initial teacher training, I didn't have a single session on sex and relationship education. So it is our role to make sure that all teachers who teach this are not just trained to deliver confident sex ed education, but they also have specialist training to make sure that they think about their students with SEND and their LGBTQ students so that they feel confident because Aldred says that um, if you are not confident as a practitioner, when you deliver sex and relationships education, it can have a lasting impact on how that student feels about sex and relationships for the rest of their life. So it's incredibly important. Um, there is training out there. I know that one in particular that I did that was really good is Insight. And so through the Sex Education Forum, um, which specifically is for the UK, a man called Paul Bray, he founded um this uh, company called insight and it's brilliant because he did it because he recognized the vulnerability of these students in our classrooms and the importance of making sure we get the education right the next slide so uh other ways you can make sure your curriculum supports everyone seeing themselves in loving relationships is putting sex and relationships education into the everyday so the hidden curriculum in school is something that um, we must make sure is taught explicitly for the students in our classroom. These are the things we learn in between the academia. We need to make sure that because uh, mainstream media is still incredibly heteronormative, although 
absolutely since I came out when I was 14 it's definitely better the only people I saw then when I came out were queer as folk <laughs> so um it is there's lots of different media but still LGBTQ media is not as uh, widespread as heteronormative media so it means that our students need to learn from us they need to have these conversations so that they understand that them having the opportunity for a healthy relationship in society is normalized uh, I had a conversation with one of my students last year where we talked about the fact he was feeling like he might be asexual and he didn't know what that meant and he didn't understand how many other people might be feeling this way and actually by answering those literal questions you change someone's life in minutes and that therefore it can't just be about the RSE lessons it needs to be about those everyday questions that just happen and could be life changing, but you need to make sure you're listening to your students. Um, it's making sure you address the misconceptions. When an autistic person sees something, and I know Sarah was saying about marking, very literally sometimes, you need to make sure your language about stuff, uh, particularly the use of idioms, the th things that are just nuances in the English language, we need to make sure that we are literally addressing them so that everyone in our classroom understands them, particularly when it's about relationships. Um, but also the use of concrete examples, the use of role plays, particularly in relationship elements of lessons. And this doesn't have to just be PSHE. There's low, particularly in English, but also in history, we talk about relationships constantly. And it's about making sure that if we do not understand parts of those relationships, that potentially we're using other methods for our students to understand them. There are companies out there that will provide you with uh, uh, anatomically correct dolls, if that's something you require to make sure that your students understand. But it's thinking about how you would go through the concrete to the abstract in your maths education. Those things do have to happen for neurodivergent people in terms of relationships at times as well. And the next slide. So I think I mentioned it before. The other thing that I found very difficult when I started teaching my students is the fact that they didn't want sex education because they didn't ever think that having a relationship was something for them. And I know as a, an LGBTQ person myself, when I came out at 14, I suppose that's how I felt to a certain extent because I didn't ever see myself in healthy and loving relationships in anything that I learned at school. And this is still a problem for neurodivergent people. So I have some examples of really good books that I've used with some of my kids that have both heteronormative, but also LGBTQ relationships in them, but the people in them are also neurodivergent. It is important that we talk a lot about making our curriculum inclusive. We're talking a lot in the UK about decolonizing our curriculum, but also we need to make sure that everyone can see themselves and particularly in a loving relationship because actually everyone needs that as a human so finally in could conclusion you, could you read the 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 title of the books for our oh yeah of course I could. yep so um one of them's called the taxonomy of love by a person called rachel allen uh then we have meet me in outer space by melinda grace uh when my heart joins the thousand by aj steiger love from a to z by sk alley and The Boy Who Steals Houses by C.G. Drews. So these are all then conversations you naturally will start to have within your classroom because um, you obviously will start to uh, talk about it when it's put in front of you. When you're all reading it, you have to talk about it in the classroom. So uh, finally, in conclusion, um, it's important that uh, we make sure that all students feel visible in the curriculum they learn. And we talk a lot about LGBTQ students feeling this, but we have a duty not just to represent those students who are also neurotypical, but all the intersectionalities. So whilst I'm saying I'm talking about um, neurodivergent people, obviously this in, is in terms of race, this is in terms of culture, religion, everyone should be able to see themselves within the curriculum. So I suppose my challenge to all of you educators out there is how you're making sure uh, that every student in your care can see themselves having healthy and safe relationships. And after this year where we've been tested to the max about our relationships and our ability to love people, I think it's important we make sure all our young people have the tools to access these relationships 
and make them explicit. And I suppose finally, the final slide, um, I have a picture here of the tree of uh, adverse childhood experiences. So these, if you have two or more of these, they are said to cause significant adult trauma and potentially mental illness. So the obviously the, the most, uh, the actual experiences that children might face are maternal depression, emotional and sexual abuse, substance abuse, domestic violence, homelessness, incarceration, mental illness, divorce, and physical and emotional neglect. But we also have adverse community environments that our children can face. So these are poverty, community disruption, a lack of opportunity, economic mobility and social capital, poor housing quality and affordability and violence. And the one I left out there is discrimination. Because as we know, as LGBTQ educators, the absence of seeing ourselves in our um, curriculums and in our education, and if you were pre-section 21, seeing yourself at all or being anything addressed, um, it's making sure that you don't face discrimination throughout your education because you are absent from the things you learn. Uh, there is obviously, um, Leila was talking about shame, and I think lots of, in the UK, potentially lots of the shame that some LGBTQ educators would talk about is the never having seen role models in their young life. And we can't let this happen for another generation, not just for LGBTQ students, but students that are interse intersectionality LGBTQ. This is uh, something that affects lots of different, every group of society. We all have, there are LGBTQ people in every group of society. So it is important that we make sure their sex and relationship education is suitable for all of them. And then my last slide is just some organizations. So, so the picture, the, the, there's a tree and the roots have got different labels. So the roots yeah. are poverty, discrimination, community disruption, lack of opportunity, economic mobility, social capital, poor housing yeah. quality. And then, uh, so, but then, there's like above so there's what you can see and what you can't yeah. see that's why that that image is so impactful um, yeah, thank yeah. you and last yeah. last yeah yeah last so last these are some organizations that can help with making your rc inclusive you've got simplyloving.com which is a website that specializes specializes in both educators and care staff who care with adults with disabilities to facilitate healthy re relationships with the people they care about you've got the sex education forum which although this uh, focuses on the UK RSE curriculum, it's got loads and loads of resources for um, all types of RSE. So it's definitely one to go and either use their resources, sign up for, or take some of their training courses, which are brilliant. You've got the Autism Education Fust, Trust, which have got key ideas and documents to help educators in cre create inclusive lessons, not just in RSE, but in everything. And then autism.org.uk, which has got training courses, articles. They also have um, role models, uh, particularly there's one, and I've forgotten his name, I think his name's Tom, but he is a, um, a gentleman who's written articles for them, who's LGBTQ and autistic, and I believe would be very happy to come and uh, support people within their environment and talk about his experience of being uh, intersectionally, intersectionally LGBTQ. But I think it's important that you get out there there's loads of resources out there twitter is an amazing resource and um, lots of the lgbtq um uh, foundations that charities that support like all sorts down in brighton they can be really helpful in uh, getting you to talk to young people who are both neurodivergent and lgbtq but it is our job to make sure everyone's catered for in your rsc wow thank you can we can we say thank you thank you thank you um it was so informative extremely well structured because it was like what it is how it affects but it was very very practical too and yeah. I, I don't think you left anything out um and um all of these websites will be sang to everyone who's attending now but also the 1062 um, delegate who registered over the three days and your video is also going to be sent to everyone because I had a lot of messages say I really want but I can't be there so thank you uh, 
brilliant, great talk, Becky. Thanks so much. Extremely useful. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. No, I'm just reading the comments, Becky. Okay. I, yeah, it's not just me. I'm just reflecting okay. all the comments. So in the comments box, people are just basically super informative. Thank you. So we've got a question from Jonathan McBride for yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Becky, is there an opportunity for you to work with someone who can get beyond those journal barriers for you? I really relate to barriers stopping me from doing so much. I have been really lucky. So um, obviously I've, uh, um, I have done writing in the past and the university lecturers I've worked with have been really helpful. Um, but I've never, I've never thought about doing it now, not necessarily in university education. So it's definitely something to think about. Yeah how we can get the work out there because I think that's the important thing this is quite a even though there is areas so in Holland and in Australia and in parts of America there's loads of research going on it's still not something that's being researched as much in the UK so it definitely is something people need to get on board and start researching and providing practical things to support uh if people could put the question in the Q&A but I'm going to read you one thing can you reshape the link for the evaluation survey that was included in the first two sign up? I can't see on the sign up for today. Derek, do you mean the post event evaluation with all the pledges? Reshare, I'm not sure. Doctor. Okay, you lost that. Okay, every time you sign out of a webinar, you will get uh, a link to um, what did you think of the conference? What would you like October to focus on? Um, I will share it again and it will be emailed again, Derek. Thank you so much. Um, Becky, mm -hmm. I am so grateful that you actually spent your Sunday morning and did so much work to educate people about something that you're really passionate about and mm -hmm. it really came across. And at times when you were speaking, I was really moved. So thank you so much. When yeah. people submitted their contribution, I had no idea who people were. And I literally said yes to everybody because I was mm -hmm. thinking, who am I to silence anyone? Yes, Sarah, I've seen your hand, honey. Mm -hmm. uh, who am I to silence anyone who's contributing to? And I am so glad I did because everyone who's contributed was just totally mind blowing, insightful, passionate about what they do. It really came across. So I just yeah, want to thank you from the bottom of my heart because your presentation is going to help so many people. And you're absolutely right. You cannot be what you cannot see, you mm -hmm. know, as simple yeah. as. So if you're not being represented, then not only can you not become your fully authentic self, but actually it leads to trigger warning, self-harm, suicide ideation. And on Friday, um, at the launch of the conference, just, lo just like us.org surveyed over 3,000 LGBTQ plus kids and the stats are shocking. And we got it hot off the press because the, the report is coming out on Tuesday, but it just, it's, it's everything working together. So I just want to thank you. And I really love the fact that we had you, Sarah, who's representing university, entrepreneurs, businesses, adults and higher education. Whereas Becky, you are talking about school and kids and both go hand in hand together. So for me, that was the perfect panel. Sarah. So I, I'm not able to use a QA. and a So can I ask Becky a question? Yeah. yeah. It's a double headed question. So I apologize for that. So first thing, um, how, how do you think uh, that well, there's three questions in there, actually. How do you think um, within sort of actually in lessons, different relationship structures should sort of form part of the curriculum rather mm -hmm. than just the, the, the two people to come together for the rest of their life thing because other options are yep. available? Yep. But also then how do you... So can we have one question at a time then, Sarah? Yes, yeah, certainly. So the first okay. question is... So about having different family structures. So, I mean, that absolutely is something that... Um, I have to admit, I feel education in the UK is a bit behind on this. I recently, I'm a school governor, and I've really struggled at times with uh, the equality of opportunity statements 
and even not just about sexuality but like uh, families that are headed by grandparents families that are headed by foster families children in care um, and there are books out there that uh, show different types of families absolutely there's some fantastic picture books that could be used within nurseries and key stage one which are not about which uh, some of the media would have you portray that are about teaching kids about consent and having sex at five years old they're about making sure every child within your classroom can see their family in the books that we use. Um, you're right, families that are more than just two people coming together for life, there is still a lack there. So it is definitely something, because all of those different family books, they definitely don't combine the situation where, you know, mum and dad, and there might be two sets of step parents and things like that. It's usually a single mum or uh, divorced parents. So maybe that is something that we definitely need to put in there. But definitely those family books, um, every child should have one. I think as soon as my nephew was born, I was making sure that there was one there. So, um, but also that's for two reasons, because I think they always think that we're trying to, I think the element of the media and some parents think that we're trying to just enforce LGBTQ on five-year-olds, but no, we are trying to make sure that that five-year-old, if they have two mums, two dads, you know, different gendered parents, we are making sure that they can see themselves in their lessons. Absolutely, yeah, and it's not about converting, it's about no. developing a well-rounded individual who has knowledge of diversity. Yeah. Sarah? Yeah. My other question is, how do, how do you, in an education environment, what advice would you give to people where parents will say, my autistic child can't be gay, they don't understand it, my autistic child can't possibly have relationships, so rather than dealing with a young person, sort of supporting them to understand their aesthetics, so how do you suggest support working with the parents who are very resistant to the idea that their child can be sexual or in a relationship let alone an lgbtq plus person yeah i think that's definitely something that's difficult and i think from the point of view is of uh younger children who are autistic um it's making sure they still have that um education because of again their family situations but also because as educators in the uk british values mean that we should be promoting respect and tolerance so even if they feel that they should not be um, teaching their children about relationships, they should be teaching them how to tolerate and respect every person in the UK. But also it is, it's very difficult conversations and it is um, conversations where we talk about, um, I suppose, because I've, I've had one very resistant family uh, within my own classroom. And I talked about the fact that we were denying them something because I feel like choices well, it's a right, it's a UNESCO right of the child to have their own choices and their own opinions. And it's important that that's represented within education. And I think it's just standing your ground. I think it's confidence that I'm not going, I want the best for your child and I want to provide them with all the education so they can make their own choices. But yeah, it can be very difficult. And that's why it's something that lots of people don't talk about because it's so challenging. Thank you so much. Um... Yes, it is. I think I think there's a couple of things in what you said, Becky. First of all, you talked about British values. So for people who are not in the UK, uh, it's um, something that schools and FE have to embed within their curriculum. I call them values in Britain because I don't think they are they are British uh, democracy. I'm not sure they're that... just they're just values in general. Yeah, I agree. Lots of um, are... So the 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 British values in inverted comma the values that have to be embedded with the humanitarian values, really. Um, mm -hmm. Democracy wasn't invented by the UK, it was invented mm -hmm. in Greece, thank you very much. So, but that's another conversation. Um, yeah, it's about developing a, a well-rounded individual and people who say, I've, I've often been commissioned to do LGBTQ plus inclusion training in colleges and been excluded from the LLDD, Learning Disability and Difficulties Department saying, oh no, they, they, they don't need that, they, they don't understand. And I'm like, but you can actually be um, disabled and gay and, and just wake up to the fact that there is. I remember in uh, one of the colleges where I was working, we had a, a lot of people 
do, can we say Down syndrome? Is that the correct terminology? Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of Down syndrome uh, young adults working in the organic cafe. And um, the teacher there said, oh yeah, you're doing something for LGBT history month. And um, one of the boys said, I'm gonna make rainbow cakes. I'm gonna make rainbow cakes. I'm gonna make pink cakes. And actually he came out to his teacher as a result of the activities. And that young adult had been in the closet in that classroom with other Down syndrome young adults, but wasn't able to be. And what it did, because the, the teacher came back to me and said, Lila, it's a different person altogether. Like their ability to learn, their ability to be themselves, their ability to engage and have meaningful relationship because they weren't hiding a part of their identity. So it's really important, really, really important. I'm just so grateful. Um, Hans Hendrik said in Belgium, university students worked on a methodology guide to work around Mother's Day and Father's Day in an inclusive way for primary school pupils. Um, yes, please post, don't ask permission. If you've got useful links, just post away, post away, post away. Uh, and I'm saving all the chats as well because over the last three days, people are going, what about this? What about this? What about this? So I think what I'm going to do is probably like a PDF document or a Google Doc or something. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you for everyone who's attended, contributed. Uh, if you're able to help us continue our work, there is a little PayPal for Pride in Education, but you don't have to. And if you're free next week, there is a five day LGBTQ plus inclusion uh, on my G work. Sarah, I think you're talking on the new Doha Rodeversity panel. Uh, I'm talking on how to be LGBTQ plus from the Middle East and North African region. We've got um, a, a panel on intersex variations and what it means to be intersex. So click in the link in the chat and have a look. I think there's about 40 webinars over four days and 150 speakers. It is fantastic what the Gobert brothers are doing. I'm really, really supportive. So Sarah, final words before we close this webinar. Oh, thank you so much for letting me talk about neurodiversity. Uh, in, in, yeah, I just, that's been an absolute pleasure to sort of share with you. Um, if anybody wants to join and collect, join a link with me, um, come find me on LinkedIn, Sarah Kedge, as it is up there. If you're a neurodiverse and entrepreneurial, come and join the How to Entrepreneurial group and it'd be lovely to meet you all. And thank you for, thank you for listening. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Becky, how did you find? Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Any opportunity to talk about this, I feel is insanely important at the moment and Pride Month is the best time to do it. Um, I just, I want to, if people want something to do this month to make sure that they're showing things inside their school just like us the charity are having the school diversities week so if you're not already doing that from the 21st to the 25th of june it's an opportunity to make sure everyone's seen in your school we start with pride and then work our way to the whole curriculum um and then yeah just thank you uh yeah i'm yeah it's been brilliant thank you for the positive comments <laughs>